I recently watched a video um, on the Modern Day Debates YouTube channel, which is a channel I don't normally watch, but uh, I saw the thumbnail, piqued my interest, and the debate was capitalism versus socialism, Ben Burgess versus David Friedman. David Friedman is an anarcho-capitalist, a very hardcore libertarian. He's written a number of books that are very respected in that tradition. Ben Burgess is a Marxist, a communist, he does videos for Zero Books, he's also a, a PhD, and so they're both, both professors, both PhDs, both very respected in, in, their, own, um, in their own fields. And you know, you look at that and you think, um, you know, you think, how further apart can you get on the political spectrum? You know, you think of like the political compass test and the one with the four quadrants and uh, the communists are up in like the top left corner and the libertarians are like down in the bottom right. They're as far apart as they can possibly be. And, you know, certainly to kind of the, the newbie to politics, like libertarianism and communism is like the ultimate, the ultimate, you know, polar ends of politics. But what I find interesting about these debates, and this is kind of why I don't really pay attention to debates anymore, or I'm not as interested in them as I used to be, is you listen to this and right off the bat, like the first couple of minutes, I mean, they've agreed on all the fundamentals. They're both for human liberty, they're both for freedom, they're uh, against tyranny, they're against the imposition of collective identities, collective will on people. And I mean, obviously you expect this from a libertarian, but I think, uh, you know, I think the right often misses the mark on uh, Marxism in terms of their critique of it. Their critique of it is that it's authoritarian. It's, uh, it leads to abuses of power, genocide, all this kind of thing. It's the, you know, it's the Prager U, uh, the libertarian critique of it, the same critique that David Friedman was making. And there is something to that, you know, obviously communism does, has always turned into uh, despotism and it's been very violent revolutions and so on but if you want to get at the you know the core of the ideology I think that does miss the mark because I mean these people uh, despite what Prager you will say you know someone like Ben Burgess doesn't actually want he doesn't want to like genocide uh, loads of capitalists that disagree with him he doesn't want uh, he doesn't want like millions of people in gulags I don't think he does I actually think he does believe in in human freedom and liberty, and he wants a, he wants a prosperous world where people aren't standing in bread lines. He does want a utopian, prosperous world um, where repression and all these things are necessary, and the state withers away. But this is where the the critique, I think, from the right uh, towards the Marxists often misses the mark because. You know, you could laugh at this and say, oh, well, not real communism, the, all the failed experiments that were dictatorships, I guess that wasn't real communism. But I mean, what matters is, I mean, you could, regardless of if it's the case that communism will always turn into dictatorship, regardless of if, of, of if that's the case, if you want to critique the ideology, say, to a, a true believer, I mean, they certainly don't believe that. And they have a conception of, of communism that's different from that. And if you read what Marx wrote about communism, he, I mean, he wrote very little there's a someone has said i think it was john michael greer maybe he was quoting someone else though that um karl marx everything he wrote about capitalism was correct and everything he wrote about socialism was incorrect something like that and it, it is true you know 99.9 .9 of his work was a critique of of the system of capitalism discussion of history political economy and so on there's very little description of what a communist society would look like when he did write about that, you know, the few pages that he did write on, on the communist society, that would be the end of history. Um, you know, it's not a Stalinist dictatorship. What it is, is, you know, when he describes it, it is this very, um, it's language that we wouldn't really associate with, uh, with communism. You know, he's talking about that, you know, in the morning, a man can go and fish and then in the afternoon he can tend to his cattle. And then in the evening he can be a scholar and he can, uh, he can read philosophy and he can do some writing, you know, that when the means of production are controlled collectively, that everyone will have ultimate freedom. 
And freedom for Marx is creative expression. You know, Marx does think that we are uh, separate from uh, the animal kingdom, that we are separate from nature in some sense, and that we have the potential for creative expression. We have the potential for creative work. That's really what makes us human. Uh, and so Marx's idea of freedom is, is the ability for, um, for each individual to achieve the totality of human goods. You know, it's not exactly a very negative idea of freedom. It's not the, exactly the negative liberty of a David Friedman that just says, well, leave everyone alone. Don't interfere with them directly and then they can sort of decide whatever they want. Uh, we're not interested in ends or whatever. Marx is looking at freedom um, in a more uh, totalizing way. Uh, so the, you know, the Marxian conception of freedom is freedom from alienation. And freedom from alienation means the freedom to creatively uh, express our will over and interact with the world. So freedom from alienation towards liberation. And that's really the disagreement with the right and the left on the spectrum is it's liberty versus liberation. The left is interested in liberation, the right is interested in liberty, but it's a, it's quite a slight disagreement. You know, if you think of, if you think of some of the ideologies that could be represented in these debates and they have much more fundamental disagreements. The same thing happened uh, when Vosch debated Stefan Molyneux. You know, in the first five minutes they agreed they're both libertarians, um, they're both believe in individual freedom, they both want to maximize individual freedom, that's how they judge the good of everything, they both want economic prosperity for everyone. And then after that, it's just kind of a logistical argument. You know, one side argues that, well, the market is the best mechanism to liberate people because we have these examples and this mechanism works this way. And the socialist says, well, you know, markets lead to, you know, the growth of a capitalist class and wage slavery and exploitation. And um, people lose freedom through exploitation. They lose freedom through alienation from their labor, from, uh, from other humans, you know, this kind of thing. And this is kind of logistical argument. They're both arguing really about how to get to the same end, I would argue. Um, and like, I remember disagreeing with a communist on Twitter or something and someone replied and they were like, look at this, this silly person that you're arguing with. They call themselves a, a libertarian communist. What a ridiculous, what a ridiculous label. You know, what's, what's going on in the world that we have libertarian communists? But I mean, it makes sense to me. I mean, you don't, the communists, the people that call themselves communists, I mean, you don't hear them really. I mean, there's very few, um, there's very few true believe in Stalinists, you know, you know, if I make communists that doesn't believe in all of the, um, social libertine stuff that's become popular in the last two or three decades, stuff that, uh, was rejected by many communist countries, you know, Stalin came into power and he, he banned gay marriage that, uh, the previous Bolshevik government had made legal and he got rid of degenerate art and um, sort of returned to more traditional social norms, all this kind of thing. But, you know, communists in the West are certainly very libertarian, but I'd argue that, you know, that's kind of more true to what Marxism is. You know, Marxism was always about liberation from collective identity, liberation from uh, alienation. It was always about getting to the ideal... Um, mode of, of individual self-expression and this is really I think the problem with debate is like you know we think that oh uh, you know this guy is so based he's got like all the right beliefs he's right about everything I agree with his whole worldview therefore you know he's gonna like oh I'd love to see him like debate you know I'd love to see him debate destiny and destroy him or something but and then people get so frustrated because uh, somehow you know destiny and Bosch like with sophistry they're they're like considered such great debaters. But I mean, the thing is, when you enter into these debates, I mean, the, the fundamental questions in terms of values, in terms of ethics, in terms of epistemology, are left out or they're dealt with in the first five minutes of discussion. Normally, Destiny will debate someone and they'll say, well, okay, you're against abortion. Well, we have to get our fundamentals down uh, before we discuss this. And I'll say generally that what makes people happy is a good thing. And the guys arguing with will say, yeah, sure, you know, I'm for happiness. And then uh, they'll start debating 
and it turns into this very instrumental um kind of pointless debate it just you know it again it becomes this logistical debate where then it's it goes to like let's go to the peer-reviewed research and uh say if if uh and say how how this thing turns out so i mean what happens when you lose a, a ground and a sort of collective ground and for um ethical discussions and this is really largely i think a, a result of individualism you know individualism is the liberation from uh, the collective, it's the liberation from the imposition of collective values, collective hierarchies. Uh, individualism as it progressed was really about desacralizing uh, social orders, institutions and hierarchies and conceptions of the world uh, that were a limit on the individual. You know, we always had this understanding of the great chain of being that the traditionalists talk about a lot. Uh, that was done away with and what you're left with is this very solipsistic way of looking at things where everyone has their point of view and each is as valid as the other and you get extreme relativism but what you observe with these debates is that in that absence in that void uh, without some great metaphysical order that you ground things in all that you're left with is instrumental reason you know in a totally materialistic um value neutral world um where you know it's all just opinions what you're left with is material in, uh, is instrumental reason and you can just see this in the mechanisms of debate it's like okay we're gonna have a debate we have very different perspectives um you know you're a a, a liberal whatever uh let's say you know i'm a traditional catholic or something and, and we're gonna have this debate and we have very fundamental different views on on everything but you know let's we'll, okay so we'll agree that you know human happiness is a is a good thing and then you know once that's your your kind of your only premise i mean it just turns into you know people like destiny like Vosch. it's it's uh i mean you know obviously off the table is is the idea that there are sort of forms of of transcendence or spiritual life or heroism that have greater value than happiness or that provide a greater kind of happiness than we normally think of as happiness, which is, you know, someone to be sort of satiated and uh, self-actualized um, and all these kinds of things. Uh, that's kind of off the table. So all you can really do is just look at sort of logistical um, economic arguments for how best to, you know, give comfort and freedom to the individual. So, I mean, the problem, isn't so much uh, that everyone has the wrong beliefs or things are so polarized. I mean, the, the fundamental problem really in the West today is that we don't even have a basis for a coherent discussion about ethics, about politics, about any of these things. I mean, when there was a, when there was a referendum on abortion in Ireland and everyone was discussing abortion, I mean, it, the, the debates were just completely pointless. Because one side would go up and say, so the, the pro the pro life side would go up and they can't say that, well, I'm a Catholic <clears throat> and I believe that uh, objectively uh, killing is wrong, it's sinful and that has been decreed by God, therefore it's objectively a good thing to, uh, to behave in a way that's in correspondence to that it's objectively evil uh, to take life and life begins at conception so you know your rationalist atheistic arguments for this um, I don't accept them I don't accept your premises I don't accept your reasoning uh, because I believe my faith is true now that's the honest approach right and the honest approach of the pro-choice side would be to say look yes technically it's life but we have more of a utilitarian conception of things. Uh, we don't believe that there is some objective commandment floating in the ether that taking life in all situations is wrong. We take life all of the time. You know, we eat animals, uh, whatever. Uh, the fetus has less consciousness 
than some of the animals we kill. It's, it's less capable of feeling pain. And we don't think that humans are special uh, in some kind of metaphysical way. We don't believe in like a soul. Um, you know, we don't see evidence for these things. So we're making a basic utilitarian argument that if it prevents suffering for the mother, then we should prevent that suffering and we should let them have the abortion. That, that would have been the honest approach to this debate. But you never heard either side say that. Even the the hardcore traditional Catholics that were pro-life never said, this is bad because killing is sinful. All right? that, that never happened because to enter into public discourse, everyone has to sort of agree on a basic kind of epistemic starting point that's, that's somewhat acceptable, that uh, allows you to enter into the discourse. And, and so what, what it turned into was the pro-life side would say, well, uh, you know, oftentimes um, the mother is happier when she doesn't get an abortion. We have so many cases where instead of getting an abortion, they seek um, they seek help and they raise their child and they're so much happier that they didn't abort it. We have so many stories of this. Or they don't mention religion at all, but they say, you know, taking life is just wrong. Why is it just wrong? Well, you know, who would want to take, like, taking life is like the worst thing you can do. It's terrible, you know, as if that's sort of self-evident. And the pro-choice side would say, well, look, of course we're, we're, of course we don't want to take life. Of course, of course we don't, uh, we don't think that a, a fetus is of the same worth as, uh, you know, one of the animals we, we slaughter for food. Of course we don't think this. No, we're just, uh, we're concerned. We have this specific case, this terrible case where uh, this woman died due to uh, treatment she couldn't get because she was pregnant and they couldn't give her an abortion. And, uh, you know, we have to sort of fix this problem and, uh, you know, we have to deal with this issue of so many women uh, suffering through this. But I, so, I mean, it was, it was constantly this kind of utilitarian um, instrumental reason approach from both sides. You know, the, the pro-life the Christian traditional side were forced to sort of bring themselves down to making an instrumental argument for something that ultimately is not based on instrumental reason, okay? If you're purely going on instrumental reason, if you don't think that human life has any significance, um, that it's somehow like ultimately separate from animal life, then you're not going to have, if you, if you just start with instrumental reason and what will create the most happiness, what will lessen suffering the most, this kind of negative utilitarian way, then, you know, these arguments about like, well, some women end up happier from not having an abortion and we should put more money into mental health stuff. It's like, that's fine. But ultimately that argument, it does lose out to the instrumental argument of the pro-choice side that says, you know, look at the thousands of women that have to go to England to get abortions and look at the rape and incest case and all this stuff. It does lose out. So they were always going to lose on, on that playing field. I mean, it's kind of obvious. And this is the... This is the thing is individualism has this kind of self-perpetuating um, nature to it as well. You know, it's not just, I mean, we see the new trend, whatever it is, in, 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 in wokeness. And we think, you know, this is like, sometimes there's like too much of a top-down approach. Like this is all being created by the bankers or whatever. But I mean, there is this just self-perpetuating nature to liberalism, to individualism, where, you know, for the, the men that were formulating individualist ideas two centuries ago, you know, there, were, there was a lot of things that they took for granted that then their children, their children's children that were brought up in more of a current of individualism didn't have and didn't take for granted and wasn't just their presupposed in their minds, but was presupposed more was was individualism. And so it does kind of perpetuate and you see it in the nature of, of these arguments that as these things disappear, then all of the public conversations, all of the debates start to presuppose these new, more radical values. And it just kind of goes on and on. And you head down the road of this project of liberation, sort of inexorably. But I don't think it's correct either to say that, well, the problem is just everyone's a moral relativist and no one, like, it's just complete moral nihilism. Nothing is bad. Everything is, is fine. That's like how these people view the world. These leftists are complete nihilists. They just want everyone to you know, they don't care about anything, they have no objective standards. In a sense, it's true, but there's something presupposed in there which sometimes they won't, they won't discuss themselves. But here's an example, right? Destiny in all this debate says, you know, I'm for whatever, I'm for, for happiness, I'm for what makes people happy. That's how I'll judge the abortion debate. I'll say, well, 
it's making these people very unhappy to have to have kids against their will to have to suffer through this it increases happiness if we allow abortion and we allow them not to have to deal with this trauma albeit maybe it causes some suffering uh, along the way but ultimately it's greater for happiness right so that's his basic sort of starting point but it's 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 not really it's not quite just happiness for him i mean if it was just about happiness if destiny or someone like that was purely i'm just for whatever makes people happy well the statistics are in right as things get more liberal as societies become more individualist right, you have greater alienation the breakdown of communities brings all sorts of problems you've greater suicide rates um you know the use of 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 drugs uh alcoholism prescription drugs i mean like half america is on is on um psychoactive medication for something the amount of suicidal ideation is always going up all these things even like feminism you know has women's liberation made women happier well if you're going to be someone like destiny who's a complete empiricist who just looks at the facts and the data and the peer-reviewed research well you, know, you look at and there's it's, you know certainly correlation isn't necessarily causation but a lot of times it is and it does seem like the more people get liberated the more the project of liberation goes on the more alienated they feel you know marx is very concerned about alienation but the more alienated they get um you know people get liberated into becoming wage slaves and they become more unhappy families break down people feel more alienated more alone and um, people grow up with more pathological issues and all of these things just correlate nicely with uh, with the growth of, of individualism and liberalism. You don't see them as much in less developed countries. You don't see them as much in, in countries that are illiberal. And it seems like that, you know, the studies, the dates, uh, the data, the facts, they're all in. And we kind of know that really, if you just want people to be happy, then maybe just destroying everything. Uh, you know, let's just destroy all our traditions. Let's just destroy all our social norms. Let's just destroy belief in anything higher it's probably not the best approach to make people happy right so there's something going on there it's not just about happiness for these people um you know they're not happy for you to just be happy being like a traditional catholic and living in like a, a an ethnically homogenous community and having backward ignorant beliefs you know that's not you might be happy but they're not happy with your happiness so there's, there's something else going on and really what it comes down to is you know, if any issue comes up, like when, when something like gender dysphoria is being debated, you know, Destiny will say, well, um, generally, you know, I think we should let people make their own choices and find what makes them happy. Let them sort of make their own mistakes. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not happiness at any cost. It's not like let's be paternalistic and, and tell people what's best for them and make them happy. It's very much um, what supervenes on that. What's more important than, than happiness is... They would say, you know, allowing people to find what makes them happy, allowing individual choice, the more libertarian mind would say. But really it's about this idea of self-fulfillment and of authenticity, right? Someone may be happy as a sort of backward, ignorant thinking, traditional Catholic that's never left his village. But it's, uh, to them it's not, it's not really authentic. What's authentic is self-discovery. It's the expression of individualism, right? That takes greater pre that takes that's more important than just happiness, you know. And they will glorify, you know, the person that is is constantly struggling with themselves. Um, you know, you see this in how quick now people are to talk about all of the labels they have for various uh, mental problems and they'll have it like in their Twitter bio and all this stuff. It's like a real part of their identity. And they, they kind of celebrate this thing. You know, this thing is more and more celebrated like Tumblr and all this stuff that, you know, the, the, the great struggle anymore isn't like with some outside force. It's not good versus evil. It's this internal struggle where you kind of struggle with yourself and you struggle to overcome the boundaries set by society and you struggle to truly be who you are and to you know to truly be be your authentic self so more more than happiness more than freedom authenticity and self-discovery really is what's valued you know because you can say authentic right and you know when i when i think uh when i think of authentic authenticity i do think of i do think of things like 
you know, uh, a Latin mass, that seems authentic to me. Uh, a homogenous community that has maintained traditions for hundreds, thousands of years, uh, that is kind of separate from uh, the rest of the world. There's something authentic about that, right? There's something authentic about folk music. Um, but to them, authenticity really means self-discovery. Um, and this is where, you know, the, this is like where the top-down elite thing comes in because yes, individualism self-perpetuates, but also you had this, you had this shift in, in the early 20th century with, with the modernists, you know, with people like Nietzsche, who, who people on the right like, and who is obviously a fantastic thinker, but you had this shift with people like Nietzsche, Baudillard, Oscar Wilde is really the, the great exemplification of it, that authenticity became equivalent to self-expression and self-expression became equivalent to self-discovery. So, you know, with the, the perpetuation of, of liberalism and individualism, what that comes from is the, destru the destruction of old orders, the disenchantment of older modes of being. Uh, the loss of the heroic uh, way of looking at life, the heroic approach to life, and the move to what Nietzsche calls, you know, this pitiable condition of the last man that's purely concerned about comfort. Now, I'd say that this was the, this is the ethic of the merchant class that was being imposed on people. This was the merchant class doing away with the priest caste and the warrior caste, you know, the ethic of, of the warrior class and, and celebrating the heroic that's done away with, that's deconstructed, uh, that's, that's gotten rid of in favor of, of a more individualist way of looking at things, the, the priestly class, their metaphysics, you know, scholasticism, uh, these traditions of European thought, that's done away with in favor of, um, in favor of other ways of looking at things. So this is, you know, the merchant worldview is is really imposed but what you get with the the modernists is you know they're adapting to the great economic technological change of the time and they're looking for authenticity and they're trying to kind of push the contradictions of modernism to their extremes uh, to sort of you know to try and kind of transcend them and find something in the contradiction but what you get really a lot repeated throughout this is this idea that life is about free expression and life is the ideal life is the artist the artist is, is the ultimate expression of what it's all about you know it's self-discovery through creative cre uh, creativity through true you know creative uh, creative destruction of of old norms um and true you know expressing their true self their authentic self um and so that's this is where you know you get the, then the destruction of old approaches to art it's like well why write a novel in this traditional form why not write a stream of consciousness why make art to be beautiful you know that's kind of a, an imposition of of the collective will the collective identity of of old standards on us why not just make art that's pure self-expression that's coming from this sort of visceral place that's like pre-rational and it's completely an expression of my will um you know why should the higher man be subject to the morality of the herd. Um, so it becomes about the expression of will, the expression of creativity. Um, it becomes about self-expression as a means of discovering who you are. You know, you express these things, you engage in creative action, but it's to discover your authentic self. So modern individualists, liberals, they have this very instrumental approach to things but they're not true relativists, you know? Um, and you can even look at like some of the Nietzschean strands of thought and you can think of like Foucault or someone that deconstructs everything and will even deconstruct the self, the conception of the self, but still what you're left with is when you deconstruct all hierarchies, all other modes of being, ways of seeing the world, what you're still left with, even if you pay lip service to deconstructing the self, what you're ultimately left with is just raw expression of the self. Once you've deconstructed everything, what's left is your will. 
and you're left with this kind of stern right way of looking at things where everything is a spook except my will and the immediacy of my will and what I want and how I can shape the world and be creative with the, the stuff of the world through my will. And that's really where the current of, of individualism and relativism leads. You know, the contradiction of relativism in terms of how it plays out is it's, it relativizes everything but what's left is the relativizer, the self that is doing the relativizing. And what you end up with is just this anthropocentric justification for the irresponsible or the, you know, the autonomous, completely autonomous from any sort of social responsibility or collective or, or higher ideal. You're just left with the expression of, of the will as the moral good. And so that that is you know, that is the issue we're grappling with is, is, um, is that this, this ethic of, of self-expression, of discovery through self-expression and of authenticity that is very individualist, that is very destructive in terms of suddenly everything is, is a barrier to that, you know, when that's your only, when the only good is self-expression and liberation, um, true you know transcending uh impositions what you're left with is david friedman arguing that the best way to be liberated from the social and be liberated from collective identity is through the market mechanism because the market mechanism um brings prosperity and brings individual choice and brings institutions like private property that pro uh, that pro uh, protect people from tyranny and people will ultimately choose freedom and self-expression. People flee from communist states to capitalist states because they want the freedom to self-actualize themselves. So what you're left is the right arguing that the market mechanism is the best way to a kind of transhuman future devoid of the imposition of collective identity versus the left who argue that actually the real problem isn't so much the state as it is prejudice. And the focus should be on liberation from prejudice, liberation from prejudice, prejudgment due to your race or disability or gender or anything else. And it really is that logistical disagreement. You know, they don't really have a higher ideal that they're really striving towards in terms of that something that they could kind of construct something positive around a hierarchy, a way of conceiving the world. It's all, it's all it's all negative you know the ideal is is this ideal of authenticity but really to get there it's it's more about destroying what's in the way of that than creating the conditions for that to exist and so they need a boogeyman so with the boogeyman the evil figure is so important to this way of looking at things because it's negative because it's about liberation it's about destroying what's in the way of of liberating you and this is why you know people make fun of like the conservatives that are always calling the left to uh, you know the real fascists or whatever and you know the right conservatives justify their beliefs by you know without these values think of Jordan Peterson you know without these values without us making these values um, of individual rights and the ethic of individualism without making that sacrosanct you end up with gulags and I have you know I have communist memorabilia everywhere and I have like Solzhenitsyn's um Gulag Archipelago here that I reread every year because I want to remind myself, you know, this is like the this is the ultimate evil that he anchors his worldview around, right? And the leftists, the ultimate evil that they anchor their worldview around is World War Two and is terrible evils of, of the Nazis and is preventing genocide. So they're both, you know, the when you have complete relativism and you don't have a, a moral good, you don't have God that you can orient things towards, you don't have some kind of platonic ideal of the good or, or the virtuous man some kind of stoic conception of things you know that we should be striving towards virtue eudaimonia we've done away with that because people aren't able to reason about that because all of that has been you know done away with and all we have is instrumental reason what we can create is a negative we can create the evil that we're preventing you know we're not actually imposing anything on you you know we're, we're not because, you know, to impose something on the authentic individual would be the worst thing. So we're not imposing anything on you. What we're, we're protecting people from 
potential for genocide, for tyranny. So it's it's it is this kind of logistical disagreement where you know the right says that market mechanisms and individual freedom and institutions like private property are the best mechanism for preventing the imposition of of collective will through tyranny, um, and the left says that an attack on prejudice, a deconstruction of pre-given identities um, that conflict with individual um, self-expressive identities, attacking them even through the means of the state, through state socialism and so on, attacking them and destroying those primordial um, attachments and identities. That's the best way to, more, to move to a, a transhuman future um, where we can have complete creative freedom to self-express and live authentically. So there is a kind of greater ethic underneath it. There is this idea of authentic living, of self-expression. You know, I always kind of laugh at these like pop philosophy channels on YouTube, like School of Life, and it's all, or you like the, the person you meet that they're like, oh, I like philosophy. And you know, it's like, uh, it's like Albert Camus and some Nietzsche quotes and some Kierkegaard quotes. Um, and like philosophy is just like this kind of self-help thing about like, you know, they, they read like the, they read the synopsis on, on Camus and philosophy is all about like finding who you are and, uh, and, and like good metaphors for, uh, for being authentic in, in a cruel world or something, you know, um, ethics and metaphysics and ontology and all this stuff that was just like stuff people did like thousands of years ago before we discovered science I mean I've studied philosophy in college and this was like you know this is like what most of the people thought there it's like oh yeah you know metaphysics that's like a nice quaint idea um, that's like you know they just learned this stuff as like you know, kind of just like a historical study of like you know these people in in Mesoamerica used to believe in this bird god or something. It's like, oh, like the Greeks used to believe in, in this thing called uh, metaphysics. So everything is reduced to the banal. Everything is banal. Everything is banal except, uh, except preventing the great evil of, of tyranny and of, of, of nationalism and of, um, God forbid, you know, harsh religion and the, the crusades and you know, all these bad things, the, the Inquisition and um, the gulags and all this kind of stuff. So that's why, you know, when, when people attack the communists, they're like, oh, they're, they're authoritarian, they want to put everyone in gulags, they just want power, they want, they love dictatorship and all this. It's like, no, they're like, you know, they're, they're all about individualism and doing whatever you want and like spiting your parents and like, you know, you know, again, this, this ideal of people just kind of doing whatever they want and just sort of creatively just forcing their will on the world in any way they see fit on any particular whim without any objective standard that they're trying to obey or whatever, free from tradition. And this is the whole ethic that drives political discourse across the spectrum. And it's, it's, it's literally becoming impossible to even have a discussion outside of these bounds without just sounding like an insane person. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm not... I don't watch my debates anymore, political debates. I'm kind of cynical about the worth of, of debating. You know, these people like Molyneux and, and Destiny or Sophus, they win debates. But, you know, there's a deeper rot going on here and there's a, there's a deeper ethic that at play that I think people need to understand. That it isn't just like relativism and like they just, they just hate. They just hate white people. They just hate Christianity. There is a deeper, there's a deeper ethic that people are, are striving towards that you can see expressed in culture and in all the platitudes about living your life to the fullest and, and self-discovery and so on so yeah that's uh, that's some thoughts on that debate